Thank you very much, everybody, for coming here. I think that, first and foremost, the best way to start this is um, <coughs> to go directly to the current events at hand, which is about Gaza and what everybody is seeing happening in Gaza as well. The events and the pictures as well that, to be honest, have broken our hearts. For some of us, it's instilled despair in our hearts. We've all seen the videos, we've seen the pictures. We saw the famous video of the man hugging his granddaughter. Ya Ruh, Ruh, he says, the soul of my soul. We've seen the images of the dead children and their bodies underneath the rubble. We've seen the images coming from Mu'taz Azaiza, from Plastia, from these other different accounts. We've seen the horror that's unfolded. And many of us have asked ourselves, what is it that we can do in this situation? The world is as horrible as it's ever been. We've seen the international community uh, upholding an environment that allows ethnic cleansing, that says that genocide is more nuanced, that there is an, a possibility for nuanced genocide. And we've seen essentially international law. Alhamdulillah, I studied law, but not international law. So I didn't waste my time. We've seen international law essentially become established as the most useless subject that anybody can study at any university. For those of you studying international law, save yourselves and change your subject immediately. What I want to highlight today, and somebody did make a joke. They say when Sami speaks, he says the same thing over and over and over again, but in different ways. And I always reply and I say the Quran has had the same message for the past 1400 years. It doesn't make it any less relevant. Not that I'm saying my words are Quran. I'm saying that. Astaghfirullah. Did I just say something wrong? Anyway. The point I want to make is I want to highlight is I want to highlight the reason why we've seen changes in the stance of policy makers who categorically refused a ceasefire or a pause who demanded that the State Department never use the word ceasefire or pause those countries that came out and defended Israel between quotation marks Israel's right to self-defense and I want to do it by telling you or reminding you of the series of events and your role in bringing those change. And we'll have a part one, then Salat al Isha. Then, for those of you who still have patience for me, you can come back for part two. You'll remember the week before October 7th, Netanyahu stood at the United Nations and he held up a map. And he had that horrible, dirty smirk on his face and he held up the map and he said, This is the future vision of the Middle East. This is what peace in the Middle East looks like. And if you looked at the map, he had completely erased Palestine completely from the map. In the same breath, he said that normalization of ties with Saudi Arabia will be the greatest deal since the end of the Cold War. Then the Israeli ambassador to the United Nations told Khan Television, the Israeli television, he was asked if the government, if, if normalization with Saudi Arabia is on the table, will the government sign on it or not? And the Israeli ambassador replied that when the government realizes that normalization with Saudi Arabia means, quote, the complete Arab abandonment of the Palestinians, when they realize the opportunities that this presents, they will sign off it immediately. In the same trip after making this speech, Netanyahu met with the Turkish president Recep Tayyip Erdogan for the first time since Erdogan came to power in 2003. They discussed a joint gas pipeline in the Mediterranean. They discussed the Middle East corridor. Turkey is upset that the Middle East corridor will start in India. It will cross the sea a little bit and then go to the UAE, through Saudi Arabia, through Jordan, through Israel, into Europe, which will objectively transform the whole economics of the area. The Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan was saying, don't go through Saudi Arabia, go through Turkey. We are better for you as a friend. The Israelis took that picture and they started goading the Palestinians and saying, look, the Sultan of the Muslim world is now sitting and recognizing you. The UAE ambassador to Washington, Yusuf al Uteba, gave a talk to Brookings or Carnegie, one of those think tanks that has the blue emblem. I forgot which one. And he was asked, what has normalization of ties with Israel realistically achieved for the Palestinians? And he said, and I promise you, this is his words, not mine. He said, normalization with Israel has achieved absolutely nothing for the Palestinians. And we, Morocco, Sudan and Bahrain and these nations that have normalized, have been unable to get any real concessions for the Palestinians from the Israelis. And they said, well, what are you going to do about it? He said, now it's up to the future nations that want to normalize whether they want to get concessions for the Palestinians. But let's not talk about that. Let me tell you now how exciting it is, the number of flights we now have between Abu Dhabi and Tel Aviv, 
and the wonderful economic trade contracts we now signed between Tel Aviv and between Abu Dhabi. So you can imagine when Netanyahu returns to Tel Aviv after the United Nations, you can imagine how he feels. This is it. This is my time. It's unprecedented. No one is standing by the Palestinians anymore. Nobody cares about their rights at this particular moment in time. Everybody's coming to me because they want Washington. Not me, Netanyahu, a'udhu billah. But everybody's coming to me because they want Washington and coming to me because they want economic assistance. So Netanyahu orders that the Israeli army begins to build up forces by the border with a Janin refugee camp near the West Bank in preparation for another attempt to annex the West Bank. For those of you who don't know, in 2019 when Trump came to try to facilitate normalization between the UAE and Israel, Trump asked Netanyahu not to raid the Janine refugee camp to allow room for the UAE to normalize. That's why the UAE told us that they were normalizing to prevent the annexation of the West Bank. Once they normalized, Ed Netanyahu went back and raided the Janine refugee camp. Then, unfortunately, or fortunately, he lost the election. Then Naftali Bennett came, became prime minister, and he thought he went in to raid the Janine refugee camp, and he was beginning a military campaign but then Shireen Abu Akhla was killed by an Israeli sniper and that ended the military operation because the killing of such a high profile journalist meant that the Israelis could no longer continue their offensive. This time Netanyahu believed that given everything suggests that the Palestinian cause is dying, that the Palestinians are being abandoned, that the Saudi ambassador to Palestine, ambassador between quotation marks, went to the Palestinian Authority to make an offer for money in exchange for recognition of Saudi normalization with Israel, something that the Palestinians were so angry about that when the Saudi ambassador wanted to pray in Al-Aqsa Mosque, the Palestinians told them, don't you dare come near Al-Aqsa Mosque, don't you dare set foot, you're not allowed to pray here, we refuse to allow you. And the Saudi ambassador said, whoa, okay, I'm just going to go back to Saudi Arabia, and inshallah, another time I'll come to Al-Aqsa. Well done, Palestinian. Bismillah, mashallah, Allah, billah. Reuters was reporting at the time that the Saudis had told the Americans, this isn't me, this is Reuters, the Saudis had told the Americans that they were no longer keen on a Palestinian state, they wouldn't mind as long as Biden gives them a NATO-style security agreement, nuclear technology for a, for a chemical weapon, for a weapon, for a nuclear weapon, and also gives support for Vision 2030 to help to raise the profile of the concerts of Nicki Minaj, of Shakira, of these other concerts, to show the world that Saudi Arabia is changing, that it's developing a new image, and that it is becoming more modern, and that there is progress. If Biden provides these three, then he's willing to compromise on a Palestinian state. If you notice the Saudi Crown Prince's Fox News interview, you'll notice he doesn't mention a Palestinian state. He says that we will normalize in exchange for, quote, anything that makes life easier for the Palestinians. So Netanyahu, imagine how he feels sitting with his cabinet. Guys, there is no King Faisal anymore to do an oil embargo. There is no Anwar Sadat to surprise us and go into Sinai Peninsula or come across our border. There are no Arab leaders anymore who are giving us the three no's that they gave in Sudan. No peace, no normalization. I can't remember the third no, but it was something about establishing justice. But the point here is Netanyahu said that the whole mood has shifted. Now is the time to go into the West Bank. So he sent troops to reinforce Gaza to make sure there'd be no counterattack, and he sent troops on the Janine refugee camp. The point here being is, everybody likes to start on October 7th, and the response is always, let's go back to 1948. But you don't need to go to 1948. The week before, Netanyahu was getting ready to invade. Netanyahu was getting ready to go into the West Bank. Netanyahu was openly saying, I'm going in. The Israeli settlers were going, they were setting fire to the houses of the Palestinians. They were going in and saying, we're going to take the Janine refugee camp. Mahmoud Abbas, why were there huge protests against Mahmoud Abbas two weeks before October 7th? For those who don't know Mahmoud Abbas, he's the president of the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank. The reason there were huge protests was because they were saying to Mahmoud Abbas, the Israelis are preparing for an invasion, why are you quiet and not doing anything? So when anybody talks to you about October 7th, it doesn't matter what you think about October 7th. The week before, the Israelis were getting ready to invade. They were raiding the Janine refugee camp. And that's why for Netanyahu, the events of October 7th were a shock. Because the Palestinians weren't supposed to have agency. They were supposed to be dying. The Palestinian cause was supposed to be finished. But suddenly now everybody's talking about Palestine. Everybody's talking about Gaza. 
Five weeks ago, six weeks ago, people were saying it looks really bad for the Palestinians. Now everybody's roaring Palestine's name. Netanyahu realized that this is a crisis now. Because Erdogan, who started the conflict, giving out neutral statements, the Turks are so angry that they're forcing him to take harder statements. The Saudi crown prince, who was on the verge of normalizing, is now lifting restrictions on the haram, whereas the last year they haven't been making any dua for Palestine, now he's allowing the imams to make dua for Palestine again. The UAE, which normalized ties and refused to allow its commentators to criticize Israel, allowed Abdul Khaliq, Abdullah, and Nasser al-Sheikh and these others to start lambasting the Israelis within limits. They can't say kick out the Israeli ambassador, but they can lambast the Israelis. But still, suddenly these nations are buckling under pressure. But more importantly for Netanyahu, the Israeli polls themselves were saying that this is all Netanyahu's fault. That Netanyahu brought this disaster on us. That Mr. Security turned out to be Mr. Insecurity. If you notice in that first week, usually when a country is in a state of war, a war cabinet is established almost immediately. It's a national duty, a national crisis. You form a war cabinet. But for almost 10 days, Netanyahu could not form a war cabinet. The reason being is that none of the parties thought that this was a serious threat to Israel. They believed it was a serious threat only to Netanyahu's political future. And they didn't want to be the ones to rescue Netanyahu's political future. Yair Lapid, head of the opposition, refused to join the cabinet. So did the other parties. Until eventually Netanyahu had to settle for Benny Gantz to join his war cabinet. Ten days they don't form a war cabinet to show you how the Israelis viewed this as Netanyahu's fault, not the Palestinians' fault. The reason I say all this is to set the lay of the land one week before and to put October 7th into context. And also to put into context that the Israelis themselves believe that this is Netanyahu's fault, not anything to do with the Palestinians. The problem, however, is here in the United States of America, you have some very ideological officials, such as Antony Blinken who became so excited at the opportunity that all of this crisis now suddenly presents. The opportunity to get more land for Israel, to expand Israel's, Israel's borders. Anthony Blinken immediately told his State Department, not a single one of you is allowed to use the word pause or ceasefire. This is an exciting opportunity for ethnic cleansing and we're going to take it to the maximum. John Paul, one of the directors of the, of the State Department, is so horrified he resigns. State Department employees cannot believe that Blinken is so brazen in supporting ethnic cleansing. So they start shouting louder. Blinken then goes to Tel Aviv in excitement. And he says, I'm here not as the Secretary of State of the United States. I'm here as a Jew. As if the Holocaust happened in the Middle East as if the Spanish Inquisition happened in Saudi Arabia, as if the Warsaw pogrom in Poland happened in Tunisia, as if somehow it was not the Europeans, the most anti-Semitic people in history, who persecuted the Jews and drove them out of Europe so that they came to the Muslim lands over and over again and they found haven and they found sanctity. When Isabella of Spain kicked out the Jews and massacred them, it was the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire who said, Allah, has ordained on me a duty to look after you and protect you, come to the Muslim lands, we will never treat you like these anti-Semitic Europeans. When the pogroms happened in Poland, it was the Muslim lands where the Jews found sanctity. After the Holocaust, the Jews, they got in their boats coming towards Palestine and they had these big banners, please don't do to us what Europe has done to us. And we told them, never, we will never do it. The Muslims never do this kind of thing to other populations because Allah doesn't allow us to. The Prophet Muhammad never allows us to. The Prophet Muhammad when he entered Medina and he made the Medina covenant, he said to the Jews, those who oppress you, we will defend you against them. And you will defend us against those who seek to oppress us. That's the bond between the relationship that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has enjoined on us. That's why Umar al-Mukhtar, the Libyan liberation leader, when the Italians were capturing the Libyans and torturing them, when, they, when the Libyans finally captured Italians, they said, let's do to them what they do to us. Umar Mukhtar said, they are not our teachers. These anti-Semitic Europeans are not our teachers. 
One of the reasons that Jews searched for an independent state was because the Europeans treated them so horribly. They used to massacre them and persecute them. Even the Balfour Declaration. The Balfour Declaration was not a favor to the Jews. It was an anti-Semitic proposal by Balfour in which he said, we don't want these alien Jews. We don't want them here. We want to kick them out. Go anywhere. Go Argentina, Uganda, go anywhere. We don't want you here. And that's why it was the only Jewish representative, uh, the only Jewish representative in parliament actually stood up and rejected the Balfour Declaration. He said, what is this anti-Semitism you want to kick us out of the country? We always assume it was a favor. It wasn't. It was because Europe was so anti-Semitic that they were passing laws in parliament and making declaration to get the Jews out of Europe. It's a uniquely European affair. So when Blinken turns up in Tel Aviv and says, I'm here as a Jew, I can't lie to you. When I heard it, I said, Alhamdulillah, you Jews have always been safe here. Marhaba, khuya. Well, welcome. Yeah, I know it must be tough for you guys, you know, in Europe and within in the bar barbaric nature of Europe. Come to the Muslim lands. We always look after you. Andalusia is the epitome of coexistence. You know, even to this day, Sarajevo is called the Jerusalem of Europe. Sarajevo, Muslim city in the heart of Europe, is called the Jerusalem of Europe. Why? Because it's the only European city where the religions live side by side peacefully under which rule? Under Muslim rule. Even they acknowledge it. But anyway, Blinken turns up to Tel Aviv and he says, I'm here as a Jew, not as the Secretary of State. And Blinken says, we will give every support for the Israelis to ethnic cleanse and to bombard Gaza. The problem, however, is there is an issue. When Blinken lands in Tel Aviv and meets with Netanyahu, he's supposed to go straight to Washington. But then he tells the journalists that we're not going home to Washington, guys. We need to go see Bin Salman in Saudi Arabia. We need to go see the UAE. We need to go see Qatar. There's something urgent that I've discussed with Netanyahu that needs to be remedied very quickly. And we political analysts went, what, 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 what happened? What, what, what did they say that requires them to go to the regional powers? Washington Post the next day reported, Blinken fails in his trip to the regional powers. And it said Blinken had gone to ask them to tamp down on public anger. Blinken and Netanyahu sat there and said that Muslims in the Bay Area are talking about Palestine so much that they're forcing a shift in public opinion. I'm going to seek help from bin Salman and bin Zayed and from our allies to get the Bay Area Muslims to be quiet. The Secretary of State and Netanyahu talked about you in their war room. Think about it. Think about it. They talked about the priorities, the highest levels of state. They sat in their war room and they said that these guys in there are so problematic. I need to go on a plane. I need to fly thousands of miles in order to try to get help to get them to be quiet. So some of the leaders say, Abshir, don't worry. I've got this. Abdurrahman al Sudais, salam alaikum. I need a fatwa that says that Gaza is fitna and that they should not talk about it because it might turn them against Wali al-Amr. Abshir ya tawil umr hadr. Sudais in the, in the Haram in Mecca, he tells them, may Allah bless Gaza and give them victory. But don't talk too much about Gaza, things that you have no right to talk about. Because this is a fitna that will lead you against your rulers. I had a Turkish friend who said to me, Sami, sometimes in your videos you exaggerate about the extent to which the ulama are used to keep people quiet about Gaza. I said, okay, hadr, no problem. He said to me, I'm going to Umrah in Medina and I'm going to prove to you that they're talking about Gaza and Palestine. Talk Allah, Habibi, may Allah... When you're there, make dua that I have a chance one day in my lifetime to make Umrah again as well, inshallah. Say Ameen. Because it's not nice. People say they want to be political analysts. I tell them you don't want to bear the consequences of it. So he goes and he sends me a voice note, 10 minutes long. And he says, Sami, the Imam in Medina said Gaza and I recorded it for you. Here you go. Say something, Kazi. So I listen to the voice note. He doesn't understand Arabic, Muskin. The Imam in the voice note says, our hearts are bleeding for Gaza, but ya ibad Allah, beware the people who are trying to cause fitna and turn you against your leaders. Do not talk about issues that you do not know. Trust our leaders that they know what they are doing. Give your backing to our leaders. Don't burden them with your analyses. Stick to your leaders and obey them. This is the sunnah. This is what Islam is about. Astaghfirullah al-Azim. Astaghfirullah. Astaghfirullah. Medina al-Munawwar. Next to the grave of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Not only that, Bin Salman offers Blinken something else as well, where Blinken goes back and the Saudis 
decide to do something that no other Arab countries does. And bear in mind the opinions expressed here are the opinions of the speaker only, not of the Muslim Center of the Bay Area. Please let them continue to do Umrah, inshallah. It's not their fault. Wallah, it's only mine. And please don't hold them to account for it. The organizers did not know what I was going to say. So on the night that Israel turns off the internet on Gaza and begins its ground invasion, Shakira is dancing in Riyadh in a Riyadh season. The UAE, Oman, Kuwait, and these other countries all banned their festivals. They all stopped it in solidarity with Gaza. But Turkey al Sheikh, the descendant of Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab, I know the irony, the descendant of Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab, who is the, not Muhammad Abdul Wahab, Turkey al Sheikh is the head of the entertainment authority and the descendant of Muhammad Abdul Wahab. Turkey al Sheikh posts on Facebook on the Friday night before Riyadh season. And he says, how can anybody ask me to cancel Shakira and Riyadh season? Name me one football match that was cancelled because of a political event. And he doesn't have the class to even write at the bottom, may Allah accept the martyrs of Gaza. So Saudi Arabia says, okay, no problem, Blinken, don't worry. Jared Kushner, the son-in-law of Trump, is invited to Saudi Arabia as the keynote speaker at the Davos Forum. So in the middle of Riyadh, in the third week of bombing of Gaza, Jared Kushner from the heart of Saudi Arabia says, that the Palestinians wanted to ruin the Abraham Accords, but the Saudis and the Israelis will not allow that to happen. And that the Saudis are aware that these Palestinians are also a threat to them. And he starts celebrating the Abraham Accords from the heart of Saudi Arabia. Then Jared Kushner comes back to the US and he says, the Saudis are still very enthusiastic about normalization of ties, and I felt safer in Saudi Arabia than I do on some of the university campuses here in the United States. But some countries refuse Blinken's request. Sisi does something that I didn't expect him to do. He turns on the cameras when Blinken sits with him and he starts lecturing Blinken for 40 minutes, telling him, uh, what does it mean when you come to Tel Aviv and say, I'm here as a Jew? We've never done anything to the Jews. Well, what kind of language is this? Give me an example of something that we did. Yeah, Blinken, what are you doing? To be honest, as much as whatever my opinions about CCR, it was an excellent lecture. Blinken goes to Jordan and says to the Jordanians, I know that you're very angry, I know. But why don't we get the Palestinian Authority to rule over Gaza afterwards, instead of Hamas? In Jordan, 50% of the population are Palestinians. King Abdullah can't do anything that upsets the Palestinians. He tells them, get the hell out of my door. You know, how dare you, you put me in this very difficult position, you know? So, Blinken goes back and reports to Biden. So Biden comes up with an idea. On the 20th of October, Biden says, just tap the table when I'm... Because sometimes, you know, they, they, get, they feel embarrassed to tell me to stop, but they can't tell me to stop. So Biden on the 20th of October announces that he's going to deal with this problem by presenting a bill to Congress, in which Congress will dedicate millions of dollars to give to Egypt and Jordan and they will forgive the debt of Egypt if they take in the Palestinians. Biden says, look here, Jamaa, I know that you guys are concerned about the fallout of what's happening in Gaza, but we can help to accelerate the ethnic cleansing process. To accelerate it, we will give you money, just open the border and let the Palestinians come in, and you don't have to spend a penny, we will spend the money, we will fund the ethnic cleansing, just take in the Palestinians. Sisi says, absolutely no way, they already call me a traitor for doing a coup, they're going to call me a traitor for contributing to a Nakba. but then I'm not doing it, do I look stupid? The, uh, the Samah Shukri tells Financial Times that if we're forced to take in the Palestinians, we will put them all on boats and send them to Europe, and you can deal with them. Not the nicest thing to say about Muslim brothers, but it is what it is. The Jordanians say any displacement of Palestinians from Gaza, outside of Gaza, will mean a declaration of war. As a result of this pressure, Biden on the 28th of October says that no Palestinians should be kicked out of Gaza, they should stay in Gaza. Some of you might be thinking, why didn't Sisi open the border? Sisi didn't open the border because he was concerned that the Palestinians would come rushing in and then he'd be complicit in the Nakba. It's one of those very awkward catch-22, even I don't know what's the right decision to open the border or not to open the border. But what is clear is that as a result of Sisi not budging and King Abdullah not budging, Biden ended up abandoning the idea of giving money to those countries to take it. Now I thought Biden was lying because Biden did say that he saw images of beheaded babies and then the White House were like, whoa, whoa, whoa. No guys, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't. 
it's Netanyahu who told him he didn't see any pictures of beheaded babies. So I thought maybe the Kadhab is lying. And then John Kirby came out the next day and said, yes, we, we, we won't see the displacement. However, a new problem starts emerging. While they're trying to plot about the day after Gaza and facilitate the ethnic cleansing, polls start coming out in America that suggest that Biden is now behind Trump in five or six swing states. Not only that, in four of those swing states, Muslims are the deciding vote. So Biden starts to panic. And Biden says, guys, with all due respect, I love the Israelis and the Zionists, but I ain't losing an election for them. So Blinken says, please wait, don't do anything yet. I have a genius idea. Let me go to Tel Aviv and present it to them. Now I have to confess, this, is actually, this was actually a genius idea. Blinken came up with a marketing strategy for ethnic cleansing. He went to the Israelis and he said to them, guys, you're too loud and brazen with your ethnic cleansing. You can't say you're going to annihilate Gaza. And you can't say you're going to nuke Gaza. You have to use more humane and merciful terminology. They said, what do you mean, Blinken? According to Axios, by the way, Axios, Blinken's exact phrase was, help me to help you. Because the public pressure in the United States from these annoying Muslims in the Bay Area and the annoying Muslims in LA and the annoying Muslims in North Carolina and the Muslims across America, their voices are so loud that they're forcing a shift in public opinion. I'm worried that Sleepy Joe is buckling and we need to rescue this attempt at ethnic cleansing because it may never come again. So yeah, Netanyahu, don't say that you're annihilating Gaza. Say that you will have a humanitarian pause where you will allow the families mercifully to leave their homes four hours every single day and that they will go through humanitarian corridors under the protection of the Israeli army. Netanyahu, what do you think? So you keep ethnic cleansing, but we make it look merciful and humane. Netanyahu responds according to Axios. This isn't my words. Netanyahu says, I need to know that this is not a plan from Biden to lure me into a ceasefire. I need to know this isn't like 2021 where Biden kept saying he supports me and then called me randomly one day and said, stop. No more support. And that's why if you remember Biden, when the humanitarian pause was implemented, Biden told journalists it came late, but at least it came. Because Biden acknowledged the frustration that Netanyahu did not implement it when he asked him to. You think they are united, but قلوبهم shatter, but their hearts are divided. So Netanyahu implements this humanitarian pause. The, I got the sign. The problem is, however, that once again, the Ummah refuses to be silent. So they start showing pictures of the modern day Nakba, of an elderly woman in the wheelchair having to go hundreds of, or tens of miles to escape because the Israelis want to take her home. They're showing pictures of corpses on the street that Israel has taken. They're seeing now that people who supported Israel in the past are now doing videos where they are saying that they're now becoming increasingly pro-Palestinian. They're seeing people on TikTok start to open the Qur'an and say, you know what? I want to know how these Palestinians have so much resilience. I want to know what it is that makes them so resilient. So I'm going to do every day, of sorry for the accent, I know it's poor, but I'm going to do a video every single day, guys, of the Qur'an and the verses that are in the Qur'an, and I want to know where they get it. So now they're finding that people are opening the Qur'an, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is guiding them to Islam. You remember the girl in the first week she opened the Quran. And then I saw her last week with Dr. Haifa Yunus. She'd taken her shahada, put on the hijab, and she became Muslim, subhanAllah. They plan on our plans. Suddenly we're seeing that people are now reading about what's happening. There was a really good video. So my sisters pleaded with me eight months ago to get on TikTok and Instagram. I'm not old by any stretch, but the other issues I had with it was TikTok felt like a waste of time. And Instagram is a picture-oriented thing, and I don't take many pictures, even when I'm on holiday. May Allah bless the creators of TikTok and Instagram, and give them the highest Jannah. <laughs> Truly, I mean it. Because as a result of TikTok, I saw one video as part of the trend, where a girl is doing a simulation of a conversation between an Israeli and somebody who knows nothing about Palestine-Israel. And I'll try to imitate it here. 
Oh my God, October 7th, they killed us. They did this, they did that. Oh my God, what? They killed civilians? They killed babies? They killed... Yeah, they did. They're barbarians. They're animals. But why? Why would they do that? What, what would make people do that? I don't know. I don't know. They're just barbarians. What can you do? No, no. no. You know what? This freaks me out. I got to read about this. No, don't read about it. Don't read about it. Don't open the book. Don't read about it. No, no. I got to read it. Don't, don't read. Don't read. That's the mood that everybody is having when they're starting to open the books and start realizing. There was a very nice phrase from TikTok. They met with TikTok directors last week and they said to TikTok, you need to stop sharing pro-Palestinian content because you're promoting terrorism or the like. They said, listen, it's not the algorithm. It's just a new generation of pro-Palestinian. It's just that the argument is convincing a new generation. Because what, how, what was happening, what was troubling Blinken and Netanyahu is that for those of you who work in tech, I don't know much about tech, I'm not going to claim I know much, but I do know this. I do know that what social media likes more than anything else is not truth or fact. They like popular posts. So when they saw that hashtag Palestine was being shared, not in the millions, but in the billions, first by 1.9 billion Muslims around the world, one thing Elon Musk did really good, and I, and I really resented that Elon Musk took over Twitter. I was one of those, you know, arrogant intellectuals who was like, you know, لا حول ولا قوة إلا He's going to ruin Twitter. But mashallah, it's the greatest day in Twitter's history. And I'll tell you why. Musk did something where, if you notice when you open Twitter or X, let's show respect for him in, in this regard. Don't worry about his visit to Tel Aviv. I'm ignoring that for now. The thing that he did with X was, if you notice when you open it, he gives you a home page of people that you don't follow. That's the first page that opens up. That home page is compiled of popular posts that are trending around the world. So what it meant was that Dave sitting in East London opened up X and he went, I oh, stay, have you seen this? Steve, Steve, I'm not being funny, right? Oh, these Israelis are killing babies. Right? They're killing women and children, mate. Oh, they're lunatics, they're, 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 they're insane. Hey, what's this? Oh, who's this Hamas there? So oh, oh, just because of Hamas, they're killing all these people, mate. Nah, nah, I can't have it. Oh, oh, let's get the lads, let's go to the pub and let's talk about it. Guys, oh, yeah, I saw, oh, you need to see this video. See this video, see this video. Look at this guy holding his baby. Look at this guy holding his, look, look, do, 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 do. So suddenly, the algorithm was favoring those Palestinian posts, delivering it to new corners of the world, resulting in shift in public opinion. So when the second poll came out in the US, it showed that Biden's numbers were falling even further. Now, some of the Democrats tried to say that this was because of the economy. Some of, the Democrats, some of the Democrats tried to say that it's because of the economy. But one thing that the pollsters said, according to Reuters, is that the reason these polls are so shocking is because usually it's the economy. But these polls are dropping because of Biden's stance on Israel. And the reason that's shocking is because this is the first time that the polls have been affected by a war where the US doesn't officially have troops on the ground. Usually the reason they fall in polls because of war is because why are our boys fighting all the way in Iraq? Why are they fighting all the way in Afghanistan? This time they're not even fighting in those areas and still the polls are dropping because the Ummah is roaring and people are hearing that roar. They're hearing those voices. They're hearing the Palestinian voices for the first time ever. And that's resulting in a public shift that made Blinken and Biden buckle. It made them buckle. So when they did this humanitarian pause in order to humanely and mercifully ethnically cleanse, nobody bought it. Instead, we saw tweets such as, oh my God, you pause the genocide. How do you pause ethnic cleansing? How is it? It's like, uh, I know, I know Bersam Yusuf's role in the Egyptian coup was horrible. I know. Yes, I know. But Allah chooses his vehicles, not us. Bersam Yusuf said the wonderful thing in the Piers Morgan interview where he said, Piers Morgan said to him, but the Israelis are warning the families before they bomb them. And Bersam Yusuf said, how cute. Oh, excuse me. So, sorry, sir. We're going to bomb your house in, in, in a few hours. Do you mind leaving so that we can do so? Oh, my, what a cute army this is. People were seeing that and they were doing TikTok and memes and jokes. There were jokes coming out where I remember I saw a video. This isn't Muslim videos. These are, for example, people, ordinary white Americans who are making jokes where you sit on a table and somebody goes, excuse me, can I sit with you? And then you come back, you go to the bathroom, you come back and suddenly he's taken over the whole table. And he says, oh, mate, you've been Israel. 
These were going viral. These, these memes were going viral. We were seeing these were becoming popular on social media. This is what the algorithm was promoting. And it is reported, I don't know if it's true, but it was reported from an Israeli analyst that said for every pro-Israel video people watch, they're watching 15 pro-Palestinian videos. That was, and not only that, think about it. Israel spent millions on advertising for ethnic cleansing. You know when I did the Yaqeen podcast, when I went to rewatch it on YouTube because somebody laughed at the teacup that I was using in that, in that interview, when I went to rewatch it, the advert that came up before I started watching was IDF advert. When I went to listen to Sheikh al Shuraim Surah Taha, IDF advert came up beforehand. When I went to see to try to cut some clips from the Thinking Muslim podcast, IDF advert came up. I said, Subhanallah, they're not even trying to tailor the marketing. They're just spending billions to do it. You broke that for free. You broke their narrative for free. All that money was wasted. You broke it for free. That's why we should make dua that Allah guides the founders of social media. Because they changed the game. I have never seen mainstream presenters on TV apologize for their coverage on Palestine and Israel. When the, when the CNN came out and apologized for giving wall-to-wall -wall coverage over the issue of the beheaded babies, I ask you, Billahi la, Billahi la, 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 la. I ask you honestly, did she apologize because Netanyahu called and said, Wallahi, you weren't fair in your coverage? He doesn't say Wallahi, but do, do, do you think it's because Netanyahu asked? Do you think it's because Biden said, oh my goodness, please uphold your journalistic standards? Do you think it's because Blinken said, where is the integrity here? No, she apologized because you were so loud in your denouncing of CNN that the presenter had no choice but to come out and say, my goodness, what's this roar? What's this wave? What's this pressure that's being bear brought to bear on me? Let me apologize and get them off my back. You made her apologize. The BBC, I went to the million man protest, alhamdulillah. Very proud. And I took my kids as well. My four-year-old Suleiman on my shoulders. Free, free, Palestine. Free, free, Palestine. <laughs> Mashallah. The BBC tried to say this was in protest of Hamas supporters. Within 24 hours, they were forced to apologize. Again, why? Because there was a roar. It just hounded them. They said there's so much negative feedback. We have to apologize. You not only made Blinken buckle, you made the mainstream media buckle as well. The power that you thought was insignificant, Allah amplified it and made it significant. And while calling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I'll finish the rest of the story inshallah after Salat al Isha, because you told me one minute. And Jazakum Allah al Khair, we'll finish the story after Salat Isha. But, but we'll, we'll continue inshallah. So, we got to the point about people starting reading about Palestine and Israel and then why that was becoming problematic. So eventually Netanyahu had to cede and allow the humanitarian pause. He had to adopt a new marketing strategy for ethnic cleansing. Now the reason why I want to stop here for a second is because I want you to appreciate exactly what you forced Netanyahu to do. It is true that the humanitarian pause is simply a ploy to redefine or remarket ethnic cleansing. But I ask you, was that Netanyahu's ideal situation? Was that Netanyahu's ideal marketing? Was that Netanyahu's ideal move? It was not. Netanyahu buckled and was forced to adopt measures in response to a power that was being brought to bear on him. There was a power that was pressuring him in order to revise and reconsider the manner of his ethnic cleansing. I argue that that power was not the Gulf states, that power was you and every other Muslim who shared on social media and every other Muslim who shared on Palestine, who changed the public opinion. And that's what forced Netanyahu to buckle in his first concession with regards to the humanitarian pause. It was you, not the Gulf states. The reason why I want to highlight that is to emphasize that you thought you had no power, but in reality, you do have power. You are in the considerations of the policymakers throughout this conflict. But for you, Netanyahu would have continued the way that he was conducting himself. But Blinken scrambled because he said that your voice was so loud and so effective. They needed a new marketing strategy for ethnic cleansing that failed miserably because within one week or one week and a half of this humanitarian pause, suddenly they were discussing about the day after. During that humanitarian pause, we saw the horrific images of families being forced out of their homes and having to make that journey down to the south of Gaza. The problem is, however, is that the Israelis are not used to showing respect for other people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself says in the Quran, 
ذلك بأنهم قالوا ليس علينا في الأميين سبيلا when they are told why do they treat people badly they say we have you cannot blame us for treating the unlettered people this way so the IDF decided to bomb Jabalia refugee camp and they massacred and slaughtered 400 Palestinians including women and children because they claimed they were targeting one Hamas commander that they could not confirm even if they killed him or not when the IDF commander went on CNN that night and the CNN presenter was trying to find a way to market this tragedy in a way that doesn't make Israel look bad. So he asked the IDF commander, what happened? Was it a blast? Was it an explosion? IDF said, no, mate, we did it. Yeah, we did it. What's the problem? And you watch the CNN presenter. Go back to the video. Search IDF CNN Jabalia. The presenter is stunned. He forgets to ask his next question for a good 10, 15 minutes. The confession is so brazen that New York Times enters the scene and says, yeah, IDF, what's this? You, you can't be so open about your genocide. We have a suggestion here to help you market it. We will say that an explosion happened and we don't know where this explosion happened. IDF shrugged their shoulders and they said, yeah, but we did it. CNN said, no, no, IDF, no. We're going to say that a blast happened somehow from somewhere. IDF again shrugged their shoulders, guys, do what you want. But we did it. They were very proud of it. So very quickly, the marketing strategy was collapsing. Instead of people saying that there's a humanitarian corridor, that Palestinians are being saved from the bombing under the protection of the Israeli army, the Israelis just continue doing what they're doing in terms of their massacre. That's when CNN reports, and this is CNN, not me. This is when CNN reports and says, that Biden spoke to Netanyahu and said to him that, quote, the bombardment of the videos on social media that is changing public opinion means you no longer have months, you probably only have a couple of weeks. The President of the United States of America, because you wouldn't be quiet, told Netanyahu that I can't support this project for months anymore, you probably only have a couple of weeks, if that. And that's why the Israeli Foreign Minister, Eli Cohen, then came out and said, we probably have only two weeks left before international pressure really comes to bear on us. So you can see them buckling over each other as a result of that shift in public opinion. Then another dynamic starts emerging, which leads us to the ceasefire truce that we're seeing today. Now, one thing that Netanyahu has been particularly concerned about is this. Politico, which is a news outlet that I encourage you to follow, very prominent, they reported that Biden told Netanyahu that while he will support Israel openly, He's now sick and tired of Netanyahu. And so after all of this is finished, Netanyahu has to go. You'll also note that Erdogan, for example, himself said that our allies are telling us that Netanyahu cannot stay in power after this has happened. And that's why Politico reported that one of the reasons Benny Gantz is in the war cabinet is because the Americans have promised him that they would work with him as the next prime minister of Israel. The point here being is Netanyahu is aware that his political future is on the line and if the war stops, he will have to face an angry Israel public opinion that blames him and that according to the polls inside Israel, Netanyahu and his whole coalition would lose the next election if it was held today in Israel. The families of the hostages, of course, are terrified for the safety of the prisoners. They've been taught that Palestinians are horrible, that they are barbaric. They've been told that Palestinians do horrible things to prisoners. That Palestinians do to the prisoners what Israel does to the Palestinian prisoners. You've seen the prisoners that have been released by Israel. Teenagers talking about beating, being beaten up by Israelis, being raped, being tortured, having their bones broken. One thing, the reason why Israel is not allowing any media to talk to Israeli hostages is because the Israeli hostages look happy when they're being released. They are turning around and saying, Shalom Aleikum. One girl is walking past going, thank you. One of them is doing a dab when they are going through. They're having conversation. They're saying, thank you so much, take care. And the Israelis are like, hey, 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 hey. Meanwhile, the Israelis are bringing out the Palestinian prisoners in headlocks. They're bringing them, dragging them by their shirts. So Israel said that this time, we won't make the same mistake as last time. Do you remember when those two elderly hostages were released and the old lady turns around and, she, and she, she's going to the Red Cross. She goes, wait a second, guys, shalom alaikum. And they tell her, wa alaikum salam. When she was interviewed by the media, the Israelis were horrified. 
they wanted her to say that these are barbarians. I was beaten up. I was, you know, starved and they gave me horrible food and the like. She turns around and she says, yeah, the initial experience when we didn't know where we were going was hell. But to be honest, they treated us well. They, we ate from the same food that they ate and they didn't harm us at all. CNN was so horrified that Palestinians are human, that they treat prison as well, that they put their headline, it was an experience from hell. Those on Twitter, the Twitterati, or the Xerati these days, they were so horrified, they said, Stockholm Syndrome. Well, if it was Stockholm Syndrome, why don't the Palestinian prisons have Stockholm Syndrome? Why, do, why doesn't a single Palestinian come out from an Israeli prison and say, Wallahi, mashallah, these Israelis treat us so well. And only they have Stockholm Syndrome, subhanAllah. So this was proving problematic. So the hostages were turning around and they were saying to Netanyahu, Netanyahu, why aren't you releasing the hostages? You've been fighting, you talk about annihilating Gaza, but my family are still there. So a group of the families of the hostages in Israel begin to protest on the streets. Ben Gvir, Netanyahu's right-wing ally, the one who goes regularly to Al-Quds in Jerusalem to provoke the Muslims, he comes out and he says, I'm going to pass a law in the Knesset banning any protest that undermines the military operations. People thought it was directed at Palestinians, it was directed at the families of the hostages. So the families of the hostages responded, the Israelis said, what on earth is going on? Why are they turning on our own people? So more protesters took to the streets, they went to Netanyahu's house. Because Netanyahu had not attended a single funeral for any of the victims of what happened on October 7th. Because Netanyahu was terrified if he attended, the PR would be bad because they would blame him. When they turned up at Netanyahu's house, Ben Gvir ordered Israeli settlers to charge and attack those Israeli protesters, to charge and attack the families of the hostages. Suddenly the Israelis are saying, whoa, what's going on here? Isn't this war supposed to be to release the hostages? Why are Netanyahu and his goons attacking the families of the hostages? Then when the two elderly hostages were released, again, the one who said, Shalom Aleikum, I really love the, 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 the phrase, Shalom Aleikum. Because it shows, alhamdulillah, that in Islam, we see Allah orders us to show respect to everybody. In a way that they don't. The Times of Israel reported when the two Israeli hostages were released, they reported, and quote, again, you can find this on Google, this isn't my words, you can find this on Google. Because sometimes when a political analyst you're advising clients, there's analysis, but oftentimes they want proof. The proof is the Times of Israel article, which says that when the two hostages were released, Netanyahu and the IDF were, quote, frustrated and annoyed because they believe the release of hostages will compromise the desire and need for military operation. Think about it. They prefer their people to stay as hostages and prisoners because they want to go to war and ethnic cleanse. They would rather see their hostages die for taking, in order to take peace of land, in order to ethnic cleanse and commit genocide. The Israelis were furious. So Netanyahu realizes that now thousands of people are starting to take to the streets in Tel Aviv in solidarity with the families of the hostages because they now believe that Netanyahu doesn't care about them. That Netanyahu just wants war because he believes that if he doesn't have war, he would be forced to face an inquiry that forces him to resign and it will permanently end his political career. And this is not Sami saying it. This is Ehud Olmer, the former prime minister, who told Politico that Netanyahu is fighting for his political career and his political life and Netanyahu is scrambling. And the reason he has no strategic aims is because his only aim at the moment is to try to make sure he stays in power. So Netanyahu invites the families of the hostages to meet his wife. Again, that doesn't go well at all. The wife says, we care about you. They say, you don't. So then he invites them to the Knesset, to their version of the parliament. And when they come to the Knesset, the Israeli officials say, we assure you, we are doing everything we can to release the hostages. And the brother of the hostages shouts, no, you're not. You're, so you're saying that you're going to annihilate Gaza. That you're going to flatten Gaza. My brother is there. Who are you flattening? Why don't you care that you might kill him in your bombing campaign? Israeli social media only took that clip. And it went viral in Israel. So Ben Gvir realizes now that Netanyahu is hesitating. That the hostage exchange deal that he's been rejecting for the past four weeks, Netanyahu now finds that Biden is pressuring him to take it because Biden is worried that those in the Bay Area will not vote Democrat. And Ben Gvir is concerned 
that Netanyahu will accept this deal because of Israeli public pressure. So Ben Gvir says, Netanyahu, give me a chance with the family of the hostages. I'll get them on board. So he meets them in the Knesset. And then when they're shouting at him, he goes, on, he goes to one of the family members and he forces in an assault. He hugs them like that. And the family is like, like this. And that picture goes viral. So the Israelis say, not say but they say, they say, my goodness, how dare Ben Gvir impose himself like that on the families of hostages. So Israeli public opinion continues to turn against Netanyahu. So two dynamics come into play. There's one that you forced, which is as a result of you pressuring on social media, that forced Erdogan to go from an unprecedentedly weak statement. By unprecedented, I mean, if you remember Erdogan in the past, Israel terror, Israel. This time he said, we want to mediate. I, I, have, I have great sympathies for Erdogan. I like his voice. I didn't do it because I like his voice. It's very strong, Mashal. Turkey, him. <laughs> May Allah protect him, inshallah. Erdogan does an unprecedented statement where he says, we denounce the escalation and we want to mediate between both parties because Erdogan doesn't want to jeopardize the ties with Israel. He needs that, that map. And then a viral video goes in Turkey where a Turk, because the Turks, mashallah, this new generation of Turks, mashallah, they love their deen. They took to the streets in their thousands in Istanbul, in Ankara, in Bursa, all across Turkey for the sake of Palestine. And there was a video that went viral of a man who said, Erdogan, you called us out in 2016 in the attempted coup to rescue you from the coup. Call us out now for Gaza, ya Erdogan. And Erdogan realized, oh my goodness, the people are going one way and I'm going another way. I need to try to control this to tell the Israelis that I'm happy to work with them, but I need to tame my people. He organizes a million man rally where he gives a powerful speech against the Israelis to let the Turks spread off some air but he repeats the phrase constantly we cannot work with Netanyahu we cannot deal with Netanyahu we cannot do this with Netanyahu the message is clear change Netanyahu and we can keep the relations as we are but the Turks are not happy they go to the Israeli embassy so Israel panics and withdraws the ambassador from Turkey Erdogan says oh my god this is quite embarrassing for me so he decides to withdraw the ambassador from Israel. So it doesn't look bad for him. But Erdogan is forced to change his stance. Why? Because of you. Because you said, Erdogan, what are you doing? Because the Turks said, Erdogan, what are, you, what are you doing? For those of you who've been following Saudi Arabia, you'll note that in the past year and a half, Saudi Arabia has been avoiding calling Israel an occupation or a colonizer. In 2021, if you look at the statement, they referred to Israel as Israel, but between quotation marks to give room for Mashaykh to say, that Saudi is not normalizing because they put Israel in quotation marks. Wonderful ta'wil. Because of what public pressure and concern of public pressure, the Saudi statement went back to calling Israel al-ihtilal, the occupation. Because bin Salman said, whoa, I need to be careful here in terms of how I manage it. That public opinion is forcing the shift. So you have the first dynamic, Biden being concerned because of public opinion, and you have the dynamic of Israel, which leads to this hostage truce and the ceasefire agreement. Here's what I want you to consider. We went from no ceasefire, no pause, no talk about it, no mention of it, no nothing, to now a hostage exchange and a ceasefire. And those of you who saw Biden's tweet yesterday or the day before, time's a blur when the time difference is so big between London and this end of the earth place that's called San Francisco. But, when, but if you see Biden's tweet yesterday or the day before, you remember Biden in the beginning of the conflict said that Hamas, that we can't have a ceasefire because that's what Hamas wants. Yesterday he said, we shouldn't have war because that's what Hamas wants. A complete 180 because of you. And this is why when Netanyahu is forced to accept the ceasefire truce hostage exchange, Ben Gvir goes ballistic. He comes out and he says, no, I will not vote for it. No, I will not have it. Why? Who is that message delivered to? It's delivered to Netanyahu. It means Ben Gvir believes there's a sudden danger to his desire for ethnic cleansing in the ceasefire truce. I saw many Muslims say, this is a disgrace, this hostage ceasefire truce. And it's true. It's a disgrace in so far as it is not a permanent ceasefire. It's a disgrace in so far as it doesn't mean an end 
to the genocide and ethnic cleansing. But is it a success insofar as it shows they are falling over themselves and now they're forced into a ceasefire, into a pause, while they revise their tactics because you've made it impossible for them to continue in the way that they did before. You made them buckle, you got this ceasefire, you made Ben Gvir panic, you made him riled up, you made Netanyahu accept something that he adamantly did not want to accept in the first week of what happened when he went to ethnically cleanse Gaza. That's your victory, that's your win, that's why you're supposed to continue as you are. So when Netanyahu accepts this hostage truth, Netanyahu is deeply concerned because the Palestinian side are upholding the terms. The Palestinians know, khalas, we've won. There's a great awakening that has taken place. There is an article in The Hill that was published last week by a Zionist writer who said, I fear that even if this ends with Israel having militarily won, I fear that the result of the damage to public opinion means that our allies will no longer rush to our aid in the future. A top diplomat in the UK, former diplomat, told Sky News that even Israel's friends are now distancing themselves because they're worried about being associated with genocide and worried about being associated with ethnic cleansing. So Netanyahu is forced to accept a ceasefire that he does not want. He's forced to accept a hostage exchange that he does not want. So Ben Gvir yesterday says, Netanyahu, I'm warning you. If you accept an extension of the ceasefire, it will result in the collapse of this coalition. Which means, think about it. If Ben Gvir is saying this to Netanyahu, it means that a conversation took place in which Ben Gvir walked away with the impression that this ceasefire and hostage exchange could well become permanent. And that's why Ben Gvir is screaming. Because they're aware now that they no longer have the momentum, that it's no longer in their favor. Qatar sent Lulu al Khatar, the spokesman for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, to Gaza to show that, yes, you can't come back to the military operations anymore. Last night, 40 minutes left to the end of the ceasefire, the Americans stepped in and said, no, we want to see an extension of the ceasefire. Biden wants enough time for you to forget about this before November. Biden needs time for you guys to really consider about Trump. Kamala Harris panicked. She published a video where she said, I'm not going to try her accent. Her accent is a bit difficult. But she said, we are launching the first ever initiative to counter Islamophobia. Look how amazing we Democrats are. The Democrat Party sent an email out to all of the members of the Democrat Party saying Trump wants to bring back the Muslim ban. We stand against the Muslim ban. Allah, Allah, alik ya Kamala. The question I ask you is this. Did Kamala publish that video because she woke up after six weeks of ethnic cleansing and genocide and said, Masakin, these Palestinian, poor, poor Palestinian. We need to do something and we're going to counter Islamophobia. No. That video came because the Democrats had a meeting between themselves where they said to themselves, guys, the Muslims are the deciding vote in at least three or four of those swing states. We can't lose them. We need to start reaching out to them and we need to make them stop saying no to genocide Joe. So what we need them to do, we need to send this email to show that we still care about them. And then I saw a wonderful response from a lady called Hind Mekki, who is an activist here in the US. I think she's from Sudanese origin, where she said, I'd like to send a clear message to the Democrats in response to this email that was sent. Dear Biden, you are trying to threaten us with Trump. We survived four years of Trump. 15,000 Palestinians did not survive four years of Biden. Don't threaten us with Trump because we lived through it and we survived. But Palestinians did not survive your reign. You can't scare us with Trump. And that's why the Democrats are scrambling. And the Democrats now are caught between no man's land. Again, the opinions expressed here are the opinions of the speaker and not the opinions of the organization or those who invited me. The Democrats told advisors of Rashid Tlaib, when Rashid Tlaib said to them, really, you're going to lose the Muslim vote. One of them apparently in the meeting, this, this was from speaking with one of her advisors, they said that the, the advisor to Biden said, yeah, they'll forget by November. We're not worried yet about that particular vote. I do wonder, will you guys forget before November? Will you forget before November? No. They heard it here. Some of my friends have suggested that I exaggerate the impact of public opinion. And that one of the examples they gave was that Rashida Tlaib was censored in Congress. You all saw it. 
And so one of my friends actually showed me the video and he said, ha, where's your eloquent tongue now, Sammy? And I looked at the numbers and I said, 192. He said, no, 252 votes. I said, no, 192. He said, 250. I said, yeah, 192 Congress people did not vote on Israeli lines. When have you ever seen that in the history of Congress? When have you seen 192 Congress people, almost half of Congress, disobey the Israeli line? What an achievement. That's without any concerted effort on our part. Imagine if we made an effort. Imagine the change you can achieve in Congress if you keep going as you are. The ceasefire may continue to be extended in short bursts. One of the reasons why that should not concern you is because I want you to remember that in Yemen at the moment there is no official ceasefire, but there has been a de facto ceasefire for two years. The reason the Saudis don't sign an official ceasefire is because they fear that signing an official ceasefire legitimizes the Houthis and they don't want to legitimize the Houthis. The Houthis are fighting because now it's their seventh attempt they believe that only Ahl al-Bayt is allowed to rule and that it is wajib to keep fighting and fighting and fighting until Abd al-Malik al-Houthi is leader. So no amount of national dialogue or the like. It's not to say that this, what the Saudis are doing are great, but it's their belief. And that's why from 2004, there have been seven wars just from the Houthis in order to try to control Yemen. But there is a de facto ceasefire in place and it may well be this will be the situation in Gaza where you don't have an official ceasefire, permanent one, but it will keep being extended because nobody wants to legitimize Hamas. Because at the moment, Blinken is struggling to find an alternative. Because the Palestinian Authority don't want to take over Gaza because they're worried that they'll be seen to be complicit in Nakba. The UAE has suggested that maybe an Arab force can go into Gaza and chain the Palestinians to ensure they don't do anything to the Israelis. The UAE are very proactive in embedding Israel into the region. Barakallahu fihum. <laughs> CC is proposing an option where they demilitarize Gaza, make sure they have no means to resist, so that when Netanyahu comes to annex, the Palestinians have nothing to resist with. But in the midst of this confusion that you've brought about, this ceasefire may continue to be extended. Which brings me to the final point that I want to make here. There is a suggestion that the options you have in the next election are Trump and Biden. I argue there is a third way. If you look at the swing states, the Muslims are the deciding vote in three of the swing states. Again, these are the opinions of the speaker. They do not represent the organization. I did not discuss this with them beforehand. Spare them and stop me at the airport, not them, please. There is a third option. Now imagine you're a Democrat congressperson in Michigan. And the Muslims are so angry that they will either, that they will not vote at the moment. Because of Biden, is the seat worth sacrificing for Joe? No. I want to be congressperson, I want to be president one day. If the Democrats are convinced that they are absolutely certain to lose November because the Muslims are going to punish them and absolutely not vote for them, if that is what they believe at, in February next year, what do you think they will do? Do you think that they will ride blindly into certain defeat? Or they will ask whether Joe Biden should be the candidate for the next election? Do you remember before Joe Biden announced that he was running for a second term, that none of the Democrats wanted to come out and confirm that he was running for a second term? Do you remember how senior Democrats were saying that maybe he shouldn't run for a second term? That suggests there are those in the Democrats who believe that perhaps he shouldn't. Now, if they're going for certain defeat because the Muslims agree that they should punish Genocide Joe and that we survived four years of Trump, but 15,000 Palestinians did not survive Genocide Joe. If they're certain that they're heading for defeat by February or March, I imagine, wallahu alam, that the Democrat convention will convene and they will say, guys, we're set for certain defeat. But I heard a rumor that in a mosque somewhere in Bay Area, that if we replace Joe Biden, the Muslims will come back and vote for us and we'll be able to defeat Trump. I think it's possible. But it depends on you convincing the Democrats absolutely that you won't forget before November comes. I think there's a 5% chance that this can be done. And the more that you talk about these issues, the more it will grow to 10%, then 15%. Some of you will say, but what if the other candidate is worse? And I tell you to these people, you are blind. The point here is not whether the next candidate is worse. 
The point is to make absolutely clear for the first time in America that just as when you upset the Zionist lobby, the Zionist lobby can punish you. If you upset the Muslims, the Muslim lobby can punish you. Allah has given you an, an unprecedented opportunity to show your power, but you will only be able to use it if you are united. And Palestine has given you an opportunity to be united. The point here is not whether there is a better candidate than Biden. The point here is to make clear to the Democrats that anyone who upsets the Muslim vote will be punished. That's the victory if you manage to change the Democrat candidate. And even if the next person is worse, we will simply have a discussion and say to each other, we punished the sitting US president before, we can do it again. And at that point, you will believe that you have the power to do so because you did it before. Remember the Zionist lobby, when they're offering 20 million to somebody to run against Rashida Tlaib in order to topple her, the reason they're offering that is because they're trying to use their power to punish. Well, we show them we also have that power. We also have that power. Allah has given us this power. Unprecedented in these swing states. The question is, will you use it? Your choice is not just Trump and Biden. Think bigger. Think about these different opportunities. Think like the Sahaba, when they used to go out in different countries and try to identify how to give da'wah. One of the things I find fascinating, and some people say that Quran should only be read as a spiritual book. But think about it, even the ayah, There is no better speech than the one who calls to Allah and does good deeds and say, I am from the Muslimin. But people forget the next ayah. The good deed and the bad deed are not equal. Conduct yourself in that which is best. In what? In your da'wah that you're giving, in your activism. For it may well be the one who is your enemy today becomes your warmest ally. Allah is saying that today you may see people standing against you, but go and make the effort and tomorrow they might become your warmest ally. Did you see our Jewish allies, our Jewish friends that I give credit here today who did the sit-in in the Congress? Did you see how they shut down Congress? The reason why is because Islam stands for justice. Islam stands for coexistence. Islam stands for rights. Islam doesn't just stand for La ilaha illa Muhammad Rasulullah. The reason we say La ilaha illa Muhammad Rasulullah is because Allah calls us to that which is good, because Allah calls us to that which is just. And that's why our words resonate with the fitra that is in every single human being. And that's why you see these allies joining our ranks in support, because their fitra is resonating with the haq that Allah has blessed us with the Quran. Subhanallah wa bihamdi. When you move forward from here, remember, a Muslim ummah that is successful is an ummah that moves. Some people think that Islam is primarily about the spiritual side of things. If that was true, why are only a minority of Sahaba buried in Medina next to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the majority are buried outside, across the world? Because they interpreted Islam as not a desire to be close to the home of Islam, but as action where Allah's word needs to go out to the world and where we need to be on the front lines of justice, on the front lines of people's rights, Muslim or non-Muslim. The Jews, when they came to us, they came to us because they knew that the Muslims uphold justice even for the non-Muslims. That's why they came to the Muslim world. That's why they came to Islam for sanctuary when they couldn't find it in Christianity. That's the deen of Islam. That's the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And for those of you who feel that sometimes your efforts are insignificant, let me remind you of the words of our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Muhammad said, Balligu anni walaw ayah. Convey from me even if it's just a verse. Now some people read, read, read this as a spiritual verse. Read the Quran and you feel good about yourself. But what the hadith actually means is, Balligu anni walaw ayah. Convey from me even if it's just a verse. The even part in the sentence, even if it's just a verse, is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saying, never be silent, never be quiet, never say nothing when you see injustice, never be somebody who does nothing, always be a people of action, always be a people who mobilize, even if that mobilization is just a word, even if it's just hashtag Palestine, even if it's just a retweet, even if it's just a like, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is telling you that even this is significant. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put this particular ayah 
in one of the short surahs, which is He who does an atom of a good deed, Allah sees it. Allah didn't put this in Surah Al-Baqarah, which many of us look at and we think, oh, how am I going to memorize all of this? May Allah allow us to memorize it. But he put it in the short surahs so that every child can learn it easily. That no act is insignificant. Every act has significance. The Prophet Muhammad said, Man munkaran biyadeh. He who sees something that is wrong, let him change it with his hand. And if he cannot, not if he doesn't want to, if he cannot, if you don't have the power to do so, if you're limited in your abilities, then with his tongue, let him denounce it, let him condemn it. And if he cannot, then with his heart, and that's the weakest of faith. Every one of you who spoke about Palestine is in an elevated form of resistance. You're not in the bottom category. You're in an elevated form of resistance. And that's why it made a difference. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu reported in a hadith in Qudusi that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala said that if you take one step towards me, I take 10. Let's be brutally honest. A tweet on its own doesn't make a difference, but Allah amplified it because we took one step. He amplified it 10 steps. And for those of you who've seen that video of that girl who lives in LA, she says, I grew up in a Zionist environment. I never heard Palestinian voices, but TikTok brought the video to my feed because you kept sharing it and forcing it up on the algorithm. And she says, I can't unsee what I've seen. I'm now pro-Palestine. Allah amplified it. He amplified the voice of justice. He amplified it because you who did not envisage the outcome, you still moved. You know when Allah tells Musa السلام, that take Bani Israel and go to the sea. Ponder this verse for a second. You know when you're fleeing from someone, when Pharaoh is chasing Musa, you would think he would run to the mountains or run to the hills. Why would he run to a dead end? Why would he run to the sea? What was he expected to do when he gets to the sea? Allah didn't initially tell him because Allah told him, listen to me and I'll handle the outcome. Listen to me and I'll sort it. Just go to the sea. And Musa السلام, decided, okay, I'll go. When he got there, Allah showed him the miracle. He hit the sea and Allah let them pass through the sea. Allah doesn't ask you to see the outcome. Allah tells you to strive and do something. وَمَنْ أَرَادَ الْآخِرَةَ وَسَعَ لَهَا سَعِيَهَا وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنٌ فَأُولَٰئِكَ كَانَ سَعِيُهُمْ مَشْكُورًا And he who does or she and those who desire Jannah, who desire the Akhirah and strive for it and they believe in Allah, they believe that they are striving because they trust Allah to handle the outcome. Allah doesn't say the, the outcome is rewarded. He says the striving is rewarded. He says the striving is rewarded. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam never saw Islam in Argentina. He never saw Islam in San Francisco. He never saw it. Did he need to? No. His efforts were so magnificent that it carried Islam here to the ends of the earth. Nowhere near anywhere. <laughs> because the, the magnificence of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was not in that he took Mecca, Medina and the surrounding areas. It was the spirit that he left behind in the ummah in which he commanded an ummah never to sit down and do nothing but to always be on the front line to resist regardless of the powers that they might have. Lut in the Quran says when the people come to oppress him, He says, if only I had power to resist those who are oppressing me or a powerful ally to it. This is a prophet lamenting his lack of power. And Allah in the following ayah says, Allah has already decided their fate. Take your bags and, and leave in the morning. Allah did not tolerate an intervening ayah where Lord's statement would be allowed to stand by itself. Allah said, no, Allah is never out of control, even if the prophet lacks power. The reason Prophet ﷺ said Shayyibatni Huda, that the Surah Hud has given me white hairs, is because Surah Hud is all about prophets who failed to convince their people. But still Allah gave them Jannah. Because despite the fact their people didn't believe, they kept going. Nuh ﷺ, read Surah Nuh. It's a short surah. About a page, that's considered short, right? Nuh ﷺ laments. 
قال ربي إني دعوت قومي ليلا ونهارا ولم يزدهم دعائي إلا فرارا وأني كلما دعوتهم لتغفر لهم جعلوا أصابعهم في آذانهم واستخشوا ثيابهم وأسروا واستكبروا استكبارا اللهم I call to my people day and night and every time I call on them they run away from me and when I call on them to believe in you they put their fingers in their ears they cover their faces and they become arrogant and they walk away from me 900 years Nuh has to put up with this at no point does Nuh give up because Nuh is not allowed to because Allah did not send them to achieve the outcome. Allah sent him with certain powers to see if he would continue striving. And Allah decided their outcome. And some of you will say, Sami, so what? Am I supposed to strive even though I never see the outcome? And I say, Ya Akhi, or Ya Akhti, it's because you haven't seen the real outcome. The outcome is right staring you right in the face. It's just that you're refusing to see it. The best outcome any of us could achieve is that the moment when our soul leaves our body, we hear the angels say, Ya ayyatuha nafsul mutma'inna. Ya ayyatuha nafsul mutma'inna. Irji'i ila rabbiki radiyatan mardiyya. Fadkhuli fi ibadi wa adkhuli jannati. Where the angels say, Subhanallah, what a soul. It kept striving. It kept going. It kept pushing. It never stopped. It kept going despite the odds. They didn't matter if they didn't see the outcome. They kept going because they believed in Allah. They trusted Allah. They believed it was in His hands. Ya ayyatuha nafsul mutma'inna. Though you didn't see the outcome in this dunya, come and see the outcome in Jannah that Allah has prepared for you. Subhan. May Allah make us from those people, Ya Rabb. Is that not the most beautiful outcome? That's the outcome Allah has offered you. Allah has says, don't worry about the outcome in the dunya. I've sorted it. Because I've offered you a better outcome than anything you can achieve in this dunya. When your soul comes out of your body, will you care what this dunya looks like? On Yawm Al-Qiyamah, will you care what state the, the dunya was when you left it? All you will care about is those scales when it weighs your actions. Did you act or did you do nothing? Did you resist oppression with even a word or did you do nothing? Were you silent when oppression was happening? Or did you do something? That's the question that will be asked Yom Al-Qiyamah. And I promise, I'm almost done, I promise. Even though I'm notorious for this statement. But I promise, I'm almost done. The reason why I'm saying all of this is, don't worry about the outcome. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what He's doing. Some of you will say, yes, but it's a tragedy unfolding before us. But what if I was to say to you, that those who have died are with Allah in Jannah now, immediately. They don't go through limbo. There's no day of judgment. I saw a wonderful picture that an artist drew. And it's a picture that always moves me every time I see it. He draws a ghost. A man is sitting in Gaza with destruction around him. And he's sitting like this, weeping and crying that his daughter has been killed. And he draws a ghost of the daughter with a hand on his back. And she says, Baba, don't cry. Baba, I'm fine. Baba, I'm happy. There's no bombs where I am. Baba, I'm happy. I'm with Allah. I'm happy with what Allah has given me, Baba. Baba, don't cry. You'll be with me soon, inshallah. Because Allah in the Quran says, وَلَا تَحْسَبَنَّ الَّذِينَ قُتِلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ أَمْوَاتًا Don't say that those who've been killed in the name of Allah, in, in, for the sake of Allah, don't say they are dead. They are alive. بَلْ أَحْيَاءٌ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ يُرْزَقُونَ They are alive with Allah immediately. يرزقون, being blessed already. And Allah says, فَرِحِينَ بِمَا آتَاهُمُ اللَّهُ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ Happy with what Allah has given them. And Allah felt in this ayah that maybe you won't be convinced by it. So He tells you what they are saying. That they are calling out to us who have been left behind. We don't feel fear or sadness anymore. And Allah felt maybe in this ayah you still won't believe it. So Allah continues. They're calling out and saying, Guys, you'll never believe the blessings Allah has given us. You'll never believe where we are now, alhamdulillah. You guys, trust me, you can't wait to get here where we are now. Don't cry for us, we're with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what Allah wants to reassure you with. To say to you, don't worry, I've got this. Don't worry, I've got this, I've sorted it. The outcome belongs to me. Your duty is not the outcome, it's to strive, it's to keep going. When everybody tells you there's no point, keep going. And I want to finish this with a warning. Now I'm not saying that these brothers or sisters are like the people mentioned in the ayah. I repeat, 
I'm not saying that those who say this are like the people in this area. I'm just saying that when they say there's no point or they belittle the actions, they remind me of this area. Where Allah told Bani Israel to go with Musa into Jerusalem and they told Musa, go you and your Lord, we're going to sit here. And Allah forbade them from entering. They said, we're not going. Those are common Jabbarin. They're a powerful, mighty force. How can you tell us to go against them? And so Allah forbade it from them for 40 years. He said, this generation, we will not give them success. We will leave them humiliated. And we will give the results to the next generation when Talut comes along with his people and Dawood comes along and he kills Jalut. Don't be amongst those people who say there's no point. Don't underestimate every action. Even if it is little, it makes a difference. And the final thing that is worth saying is this. There is an ayah that is terrifying in Surah Al-Imran. Which is that Ulul Al-Bab, the people who know Allah, who are close to him. They say, رَبَّنَا لَا تُزِحْ قُلُوبَنَا بَعْدَ إِذْ هَدَيْتَنَا وَهَبْ لَا مِنْ لَدُنْكَ رَحْمَةً إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ الْوَهَابِ Allah, do not guide us out of this deen after you have guided us to it and bestow upon us your mercy. These are not an ordinary believer saying it. It's Ulul Al-Bab, those who see Allah everywhere. These are people who know that Allah guided them to the deen. It's not a right, it's a blessing and a mercy from Allah that you were guided to this deen. Now what happens if somebody gives you a gift but you're not grateful for the gift? What happens if you get a gift and you're not grateful to the gift? Why did the Prophet Muhammad say, Ya muqallib al qulub thabbit qalbi ala deenik? Why did the Prophet say, Oh you who flips the hearts, keep my heart on the deen? Because he knew that it was not a right, it was a mercy. And that when Allah said, I'malu ala Dawood shukra, O people of Dawood, show thanks in your actions, it was a sign that we show our thanks through our actions. We are blessed with a religion that tells us to act. We are blessed with a religion that tells us even a smile is charity. We are blessed with a religion that tells us the kind word is like a mighty tree with its, truths, with its roots re really deep. We are blessed with a religion that tells us to proactively go to our neighbors and say hi and to deliver gifts. We are blessed with a religion that tells us to proactively stand by the side of our neighbors and by the side of our friends. We are blessed with a religion that tells us go and Allah will elevate those efforts. And that's why to mobilize for the sake of Gaza, Palestine, or for the Muslims. It's not you honoring Allah. It's not you honoring Islam. Islam has honored you by giving you the opportunity to be a vehicle for change. Allah is the one who honored you by choosing you to be the vehicle to make Blinken and Netanyahu buckle. Allah has honored us by giving us the opportunity to make Biden fall into the polls to the extent that Kamala Harris is now desperately trying to appease us to make sure that we vote for the Democrats in November. It's Allah who honored us because he could have left us humiliated without power. Allah honored us today with power. And we say Alhamdulillah for that power. And that's why I say to you, it is not Muslims that made Islam great. It's Islam that made Muslims great. When Islam is the inspiration for action, when Islam is inspiration for your daily actions, when you decide to strive, even though the odds are against you, when Islam encourages you to go despite that, that's how Islam elevates you. It's Islam that honors you and tells you, don't worry. Musa alayhi salam needed six reassurances before he went to Fir'aun. He spoke to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he saw ayat in al-kubra, two mighty signs. And still he said to Allah, Allah, I have a stutter. Please send Harun with me. Allah says, okay, no problem. After that, they say, Rabbana inna nakhafa ayyafrut alayna wa ayyatga. Allah, we're scared that if we go to Pharaoh, he'll do something bad to us. At this point, as a 16 year old reading the surah, I thought, Astaghfirullah al -Azim. How can you say this to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Oh, this guy has attitude, Astaghfirullah. And then I saw Allah, I said, Subhanallah. I thought Allah was vengeful and wrathful, but Allah is showing me his Rahman al Rahim. He says, Do not be scared, I'm with you. I hear and I see. And so Musa goes to Pharaoh. And after when they have the competition with the magicians, Musa again, he's still scared. As a 16 year old, I'm reading the surah going, Musa, what do you need, man? Subhanallah, how much reassurance? Allah told you to go. But it's because I didn't understand the nature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It was me who was misguided. Because Musa alayhi salam, think about it. He was standing alone, magicians taunting him, people insulting him. Pharaoh ready to kill him. Everything suggested that he was supposed to lose. The same way some of you think that all the odds are stacked against us. And so Musa felt scared the same way you might be feeling scared. 
What happens if Trump comes in? What happens if we don't do this? What happens if whatever? The same way you feel fear. I learned, I learned. That's not a bid'ah. There's nothing wrong with it. Allah won't punish us for this. Allah says, despite that fear, will you move? Because he tells Musa, alayhi salam, when he feels the fear, he tells Musa, Qunna la takhaf, inna ka anta al He tells Musa, don't worry. I know it all looks like it's against you. But don't worry, I've elevated you. And he reminds him of the sign. Throw your stick in your right hand, it will eat all. He has to remind him of the sign. And I always imagine, because the ayat, the way they're structured, is that, you know, he, Musa alayhi salam throws his stick. And I always have this image that Musa did this. Because of the way the ayat is structured. Because the ayat that comes straight afterwards is, it says, Musa found. The magicians all prostrated. It's like Musa went, whoa, and they were all prostrated before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But you know what I found fascinating about Surah Taha? Musa needed six reassurances. The magicians needed none. Pharaoh responded to them and said to them, I'm going to cut off your hands and legs and crucify you. And they said, Pharaoh, we know you're going to do this to us. But we will never prefer you over Allah. We saw the only sign that we needed to see. We're going back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we know the outcome is Jannah. Do what you want. And he actually crucified them. And now they're in Jannah with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because for them, they knew what the special outcome was. My point I'm making here is, yes, you might feel, and I promise this is the final point. You might be feeling that the odds are all stacked against you. But when have the Muslims ever won a battle being the majority? We were always the minority. In Badr, in Uhud, in Khandaq, in Qadisiya. In Yarmouk, we were always the minority because Allah made the example that it is He who delivers the outcome. And He sends allies from where we didn't anticipate it. Jewish allies, those of conscience who come with us on the protest because the justice is what resonates with that fitrah and so they join us. When Allah says that, you know, the enemy might become a friend tomorrow, is to say to you, yes, you might be scared to be talking about the issue because you're worried about what that enemy is saying. But you look at today, how many celebrities are coming out in favor of Palestine? I saw a rapper, I've never heard his songs before, but I heard a rapper who said, I don't know much about Palestine and Israel, but I know a genocide when I see one. That's changing because of your efforts. You took one step, Allah took 10. And this is what I want to say to you here today. Allah will decide the outcome in the way that He wants. People often say to me, what will happen next? What's the outcome? Wallahi, I don't know. But what I do know is we're having an impact. What I do know is we force that humanitarian pause. And we force the hostage truce. And we force the extension of the ceasefire. We made Blinken buckle. We made Biden buckle. I see the Democrats chasing after us. Ibadallah, what is the power that they see in us that you have yet to see in yourself? What is the power that they see in us that you have yet to appreciate? What is it that they fear from us that you have yet to wield in your favor in order to bring about the change? The reason the Ummah, there is so much repression on it, is not because the Ummah is weak, is because the Ummah has the potential to be so strong that they need to contain it. I ask you, what is the fastest growing religion in the world? It's Islam. Why are people entering Islam? It's not because Muslims are strong. It's because when they hear the haq, they enter the deen. I went to France. I met a journalist and he said, you know, France is in a crisis. I said, why? He said, because the new French generation, their heroes are the Muslim Zinedine Zidane, the Muslim Karim Benzema, the Muslim N'Golo Kante, the Muslim Paul Pogba. These guys will never know what it means to be French. We think that Macron is brutalizing the Muslims but the reason he's repressing is because Islam is getting stronger some of you say that the Ummah is weak and the Ummah is bleak in Bosnia Bosnia and Yugoslavia in 1920s they were concerned about the Muslim population so they divided Yugoslavia into nine Banvinas nine provinces and they made sure Muslims were the minority in each in 1938, they had the Muslim question. They rounded up Muslim leaders. They executed some, tortured some, and put others in hard labor. The Muslims kept going. They kept reading the Quran. They kept teaching their women. They kept raising their children. They kept resisting. They kept pushing back. The Serbians invaded and tried to commit genocide. They survived the genocide. Islam is still the fastest growing religion in the heart of Europe. They can't extinguish it. In Turkey, Ataturk comes in, imposes secularism, changes the language, changes the language of the Adhan, bans the printing of the Quran, massacres the scholars, 
puts them in prison, bans religious education. 1960s, the Muslims kept going, they wouldn't stop. They kept believing in Allah and striving. They delivered Adnan Menderes, who restored the Adhan. Adnan Menderes is executed for it. But the army doesn't have the power to reverse the change because a movement is emerging. 97, the Muslims, after relentless effort and striving, finally break the system and get Erbakan to power in 97. The military panics, they topple Erbakan, and then the Muslims finally, they get a mighty punch through the system and they deliver Recep Tayyip Erdogan. Okay, let me ask you, Turkey today, is it not a haven for Muslims today? Is this not the reward, the effort of an ummah that strives? So I say to you, change your perspective. This ummah is not weak, it believes it's weak. This ummah is strong. That's why I say the greatest tragedy is not that the ummah is weak, is that it believes it's weak when everybody else believes it to be strong. Today, Allah has given you an unprecedented opportunity to be the deciding vote in the elections. And as a political analyst, I'm very excited to see how you use it. I'm very excited to see if you realize it. I'm very excited to see if you mobilize for it. I have a thrill bursting through my veins that says, Ya Rabbana, I recognize the power you gave to this ummah. And I'm pleading every night. I came to America to plead with you to say, Ya Rabb, let them see this power. Ya Rabb, let them appreciate this power. Ya Rabb, let them de deploy this power. Ya Rabb, let the world say that when you upset the Muslims in America, you get unseated as the President of the United States of America. <laughs> And the final, final sentence is this. Remember, struggles are not meant to feel easy. Struggles are meant to feel difficult. Sahaba, even in the Quran, Allah says, Zulzilu hatta yaqul alladhi, hatta yaqul al-rasoola, walladhina amanu ma'ahu, mata nasrullah. Sahaba, even when they knew they had the Prophet amongst them, they said, Ya Rasulullah, when is this victory coming? When is it coming? That's how in the depths, in the trenches they felt. The Prophet ﷺ, when he was digging the trench in Khandaq, the Munafiqun, they laughed at him because he said, I see the pearls of Persia. And they said, the whole Arabia has gathered against him. And my guy is talking about pearls in Persia. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent an ally from where the Prophet didn't expect. A man called Nu'aiman from the other side had become Muslim. And he went to the Prophet, he said, Ya Rasulullah, I have a plan how to ruin it, how to ruin the... the, the. He said, how? He said, leave it to me. He whispered in Abu Sufyan's ear that Ghatafan want to withdraw because they're tired. Then he went to Ghatafan. Abu Sufyan has already ordered his men to withdraw. Then he went to the other tribe and they all started bickering with each other. They all started withdrawing. That's why I'm telling you, we need to tell the Democrats that absolutely no, you're not going to vote for them. They need to believe it. But the point that I'm making here is don't be intimidated by the challenge that's in front of you. If you feel that, the, that your heart is becoming tight with the pain, that's not a bad sign. Keep going. If you have tears in your eyes at the videos, keep going. If you feel lethargic in the morning, get out, keep going. Because it all makes a difference. Because if we don't move, the change won't happen. If we don't mobilize, the change won't happen. Don't think yourself insignificant. You are significant. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَإِن تُعُدُّوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ لَا تُحْصُوهَا If you were to count the blessings of Allah, you'd never finish counting them. Allah didn't say that if the elite keep counting their blessings, Allah says it for everybody. وَإِن تُعُدُّوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ لَا تُحْصُوهَا I can walk to a protest. I can talk about the cause. I can retweet and share it online. I can type in an article. I can hold somebody's hand and force him out of the house to join me on a protest. You count the blessings. I can think, I can see, I can smell, I can hear, I can process the information. I can go and sit and talk to people who fly 13 hours from London. I can, all of this, Allah is saying, if you count all those blessings, the only conclusion you can arrive to is that you are powerful, that you are strong, that you are capable. And I say to you, and I leave you on this point, when I started initially, Oh, when this Gaza thing exploded, I sat depressed like everybody else at home. And my wife said to me, please, you're not helping me with the dishes. You're not helping me with the hoover. Just go to the office and record a video and just pour your heart out. And I said, you know what, Ya Allah, I don't know if anybody will watch it, but I'll go and do it. 
Few days later, I did the Thinking Muslim podcast. Then Yaqeen called. Then suddenly I'm getting an invite here to America. I started and Allah connected the efforts of everybody who was moving and brought them together until you who are mobilizing, suddenly Allah has decided that there is benefit in our efforts crossing together. Did we plan this? No. Did we think this would happen? No. Did I think it would happen? No. But because we mobilized, we took one step. Allah took the other nine steps to make sure that when we take the one step, He does doesn't make sure we make five wrong steps. He guides us to the correct other nine steps. And we are here today together from two sides of the world to say from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Walhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Ubarakallahu uh, Israel says or claims that the ceasefire has been broken and several explosions have now been heard in Gaza again. Netanyahu, of course, fearing for his political future, is, is trying to resume the military operations. I just quickly had a read of the Axios article. It states that while Netanyahu is accusing Hamas of breaking the ceasefire, both Biden and Antony Blinken are concerned that Israel's actions will result in international pressure increasing and that Biden has actually told Netanyahu that there cannot be a repeat in southern Gaza. There's no reaction yet from the United States, no reaction from Biden yet. It's breaking news. It's literally over the past 15 minutes. Israel is going at it again with this ethnic cleansing and genocide. And that's a reminder to each and every one, one of us here that it's not over, that everyone has to keep going, that you, tonight you should all sit on your phones, you should look through them, you will see Palestinians reporting on the atrocities, amplify their voices. The examples I gave you earlier are examples of Netanyahu buckling. The examples I gave you at the end are that despite the despair and difficulties and fatigue that you might be feeling, this isn't the time to be curling up in bed and crying with despair. We do that after this chapter is finished. So all of you, we still have a duty now to keep raising the Palestinian voices because what all the polit political analysts are saying, including the Israelis, is that this time, the pursuit of the military operations is out of Netanyahu's desperation, not Netanyahu's strength. So everybody should keep doing what they're doing and raising their voices and keep amplifying the voice of the Palestinians. And I can see that everybody is upset at the news, but this isn't the time to be sitting down or feeling deflated. It's the time to keep going. This is a struggle. Prophet ﷺ went through Uhud. I went through Khandaq. I went through the Treaty of Hudaybiyah before he got to Mecca. We're in the trenches. And we have to keep going. We can't stop. In answer to your question, now that we've started with this, we start with the idea of moving forward. There are many strategies in moving forward. I always argue that while American football is a useless sport because they don't use the feet, I do admire that American football is a game designed to celebrate the yards that you win when you're going towards the finish line, towards that touchdown line. I see them, they win 10 yards and they high five each other. They win five yards, they high five each other because they're celebrating every step that they're moving forward in order to try to make a difference. And the question that was posed to me applies in this case. You have an opportunity if not to deliver representatives, but to test your power and to test your ability to influence the proceedings in terms of going forward. Can you rally behind the candidate? Can you let that candidate know that when they're elected, they have to answer to you? They can't ignore you. They have to come and see you. Can you deliver a candidate who, when they think about making a politically expedient decision, they think twice about you beforehand? And that's why I think that this is an opportunity that even if you believe perhaps you might not be able to achieve anything, but to test it, you lose nothing. And the way I see it is this, there are many people who sometimes say that the system is rigged against us. And that I heard somebody say once, every time we vote, we get a representative who doesn't represent our values. And all the representatives, and they talk as if over the past 30, 40 years, we've actually had representatives who represent us. As if we voted over and over again, they've always been Muslim representatives in Congress. Whereas in reality, it's a very, very recent phenomenon. The idea of having institutions like this, yes, it feels like it's been here forever, but it's a recent phenomenon. It's the result of the struggle of our forefathers, of those who came before us, who fought the battles of their day to set us up, to ensure we don't have to fight that battles and we can take it forward. The reality is we're in a stage of now experimenting with public representation of the community. You might not like some of the representatives, but the reality is it's a new experience for the community. 
You've never had this experience, but the, those who came before us did not have this experience before. So maybe the road, you might be shaking on it at the moment, but now that we're experimenting, let's fix it and move forward and make it better. And you make it better not by abandoning the path that was carved out by those who came before you, but rather when you trip up on that path, you get up and you shake that dust down and you keep walking. The representative before you didn't like, go and change them. You felt the other representative didn't listen to you. Mobilize and force them to listen to you. For wallahi, talk to the elders and they will tell you once upon a time we had no representation, no voice and ask them what those who didn't represent them did to them. We say in London sometimes they say Sadiq Khan and he's, does, he's done things that as a Muslim I think Inna lillahi wa ilayya rajiun. But when brothers come around and say so it proves the system is useless, I tell him, yeah, let's be brutally honest. Put a right wing as mayor of London and Sadiq Khan will look like an angel. They are not the same. Allah says, لَهُمْ مَسْتَطَعْتُمْ مِنْ قُوَّةٍ And prepare for them based on the amount of your ability in terms of power. Allah doesn't tell you prefer the perfect power. But if you have the ability to build a wall, build it. And you build it by mobilizing, by engaging and putting a candidate forward. That at least he will hear your voice. And if he doesn't, that one you can punish later. So I will say to you, now you have an opportunity to test your strength. Gaza has united you. We continue in our efforts to put pressure on the international community to force Israel to stop its barbaric ethnic cleansing and genocide. It's a struggle, it's tough, but we move forward. But now there are opportunities that are opening up that those who came before us did not have. We will not disgrace those who came before us who brought us to this position. We will honor them by inheriting their memories and moving forward and taking advantage of those opportunities. And one of the ways in which we do so is to try to use this opportunity before us to try to deliver a candidate who will listen to us. I encourage you to engage because I will say to you honestly, and I always use the Turkey example, Turkey, the entire system was built on military coups against everything that has the smell of Islam. The Muslims didn't sit down, they smashed through it. So always take hope from what the other groups of the Ummah have done. The Ummah is one body, and I'll be brutally honest. I know sometimes that we in the West, we're arrogant to believe that we are the heart of the Ummah. But when I compare the efforts of other Muslims around the world in Uzbekistan where they're shaking off Soviet influences and now lifting the ban on children in mosques or the like, I would say they are the right hand, Turkey is the left hand, Bosnia might be the pillars, the feet that we stand on, we're probably only the shoulder. Let's not get too far ahead of ourselves. We do not suffer in any way like the people of those suffered over there. We are in a blessing and a ni'mah because of what our forefathers and our ancestors and those men and women who strove, they built for us to put us in a position. We will not disgrace them by abandoning the opportunities before us. You have an opportunity that has been presented before you. Let's take that opportunity. The worst case scenario is that you end up in the same situation that you are today. And the best case scenario is you make a change. And I think... That means that it's worth mobilizing and inshallah you do it in a way that Allah guides you, that makes you further influential with more rights and better protected inshallah. Jazakum um, khair. I've been instructed by certain lawyers to indicate that the MCA does not endorse any particular candidate for any race whatsoever. Um, I, is that on tape? Please record me saying that. Okay. Jazakum <coughs> khair. With that, we're going to conclude with the dua.